So Ted, thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, you know, following the uh, beautiful singing that happened before, I mean, that wasn't that impressive? And what it reminded me of, let's give him a round of applause, yeah. It reminded me of another time when I had to follow something like that, which is during the first Gulf War, there was a teach-in at Fairfax High in Los Angeles, and I was asked to come and speak about the economic consequences of the coming Iraq War. And I agreed to, and Jackie Goldberg, uh, who was uh, eventually going to become an assembly person, city council person, etc., cetera, uh, was moderating this. And before I got up, she said, you know, sorry, we've got somebody who's going to get up before you. And it turned out it was Ed Asner, the famous actor. <laughs> and instead of giving a speech, he uh, got up and he acted out this very beautiful scene, and it was emotional, and people were crying, and everyone was just uh, feeling dramatically moved. And I thought, geez, it's my turn now. <laughs> and she said, you know what, we've got a special guest before. And she brought out Maxine Waters, the <laughs> fiery congresswoman from South LA who had just been elected and whose first vote uh, was actually going to be about whether or not to authorize troops to go to the Iraq war. And she gave a speech and everybody was on the feet. And at the end, she got up and said, and I have a special guest, Jesse Jackson. Um, <laughs> his speech was OK. And, uh, <laughs> And then when he sat down, Jackie Goldberg said, now, Manuel Pastor. And I walked across the stage, and two of my students clapped. <laughs> Hopefully, I'll do a little better than that today. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about the census, and we're going to go through some numbers uh, fairly rapidly. But I'll try to highlight what they mean as well, and in particular, what they mean uh, for this world of arts that, as Ted mentioned, I have a special attachment to uh, for two reasons. One is what my kids uh, are doing, but also my undergraduate majors were two, uh, economics and creative writing. I probably chose the wrong thing going into economics, but just the same. Uh, so what the last census told us is a very interesting set of facts. The, between 2000 and 2010, the growth rate, the increase in the numbers, of Latinos was 43%. The increase in Asian Pacific Islanders was 43%. The increase in African Americans in those 10 years, 11%. The increase in white Americans, only 1%. So very different levels of uh, change. And those different levels of change, while they seem to be frightening to people, some people as Ted were mentioning are a bit scared of that 43% number. Actually, the growth rate for Latinos and for Asian Pacific Islanders is lower than it was in the 80s and the 90s. The growth rate is actually tapering down. Um, now, uh, what that means, though, is that the population growth is, for the most part, coming from these communities of color. Between 1980 and 1990, about a third of population growth was coming from the white population. In the last census, only about 6% of the net increase in population uh, was coming from the Anglo or white population. With the bulk of this growth coming, nearly 55% uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, from the Latino population. Uh, it's really dramatic when you take a look at kids. What this shows you is the net change in the number of kids under the age of 18. So for example, there was a net decline in white children of 4.3 million. Now, that does not mean that 4.3 million white kids died. <laughs> we would have noticed that. <laughs> what it does mean is that people kind of moved out of that cohort by becoming 19 and 20 and 21, and less and less are coming in at the being born, uh, et cetera. And so there is a decrease in the number of white children in the United States uh, by 4.3 million, a decrease in the number of African-American children in the United States by about 250,000, 
uh, and an increase in the number of Latino children in the United States by about 4.8 million API uh, Asian Pacific Islanders, uh, nearly 800,000. So if you look at what's coming up the pipeline behind the current population, the growth is mostly of these Latinos and Asians, although it's coming from a different source than most people think. When people see those numbers, what they tend to think is that what's driving growth is immigration. Immigration is no longer driving growth. Immigrant flows into the United States have tapered down over the last couple of years. And it's not simply because of increased enforcement or because of a slow economy. It's also because of big demographic shifts in the sending countries and big economic shifts in those sending countries. The big demographic shift is that the fertility rate, the number of children per woman uh, in Mexico has actually declined from slightly over five to just above two, which is pretty close to US rates. So the push factor on the demography from Mexico has changed. And the second factor is that the developing economies are actually doing better than we are. Which is why you see the notions of Brazil and India and China getting together to bail out Greece in the Eurozone. So there's some really interesting stories about Brazilians who went, for example, to Massachusetts to make their fortune and are now leaving because they think they can make more money by going back to Sao Paulo. So with a more dynamic economy and slowing demography, uh, slowing uh, birth rates, uh, immigration has been slowing down. And what that means is that most of what's driving our demographic change into the future is the second and third generation. That is the kids of immigrants. Now what does that mean when you look at the demographics? Uh, it looks like by the year 2042, the United States will be a majority minority nation. Or as I prefer to think of it, all minority all the time. By the year 2020 or 2019, the majority of youth, people under the age of 18, will be people of color. And it's probably this year that the majority of births will be to people of color. So this demographic change is coming, and it's actually being driven more by a second generation than it is by immigrant flows. Um, now, we have seen this before. If you look at this chart, this is California. In 1980, California was about two-thirds white. By 2000, it was about 47% white. That's basically the change the United States will go through between the year 2000 and 2050. So those 20 years in California's history, 1980 to 2000, really mirror what the United States will be looking like in the future. Now, I remember the exact day that California became majority minority. You know how demographers do that? They go, the 300th million baby was born today. His name is Jose. <laughs> how did you know that, right? Uh, well, on December 15th, 1999, uh, apparently, we became a majority minority state. And I kept getting phone calls from reporters all day long. They sounded kind of nervous, actually. They kept saying, what's it mean? What's it mean? What's it mean? And finally, I got frustrated, and I said, I don't know. But we're having a salsa party at my house tonight to celebrate. <laughs> In the spirit of the new California, everyone's invited. They just have to learn a new step, right? And any of you have ever done that know you get those dancing classes before you go to the club, right? Uh, so that's part of what we're all doing demographically, socially, in the arts world, etc., is adjusting to this new demography, adjusting to a new step. So what does California tell us that we should know uh, for the rest of the country? Um, first, this is a chart which an economist loves. I'm an economist by training. Um, and what it shows you is the, you know, when people say the share of foreign-born in the United States, it's been on the rise. What they forget is that it was mostly on the rise in California for a while, right? So what this chart does is take California out from the rest of the country, something which, given our fiscal problems, the rest of the country would probably appreciate. <laughs> and 
And what you can see here is that in the 1980s into the 1990s, the share of foreign born was growing rapidly in California. It was pretty much flat in the rest of the country. It's not until the 90s and the aughts that in fact the share of foreign born is growing in the rest of the country, which explains why we had all of our fights around illegal immigration, et cetera, early, and these are now happening in the rest of the country. And here's what's interesting. We're actually, as a state, becoming less foreign born. In the last year, the share of foreign born fell in the state of California. And in Los Angeles, it's been falling for the last two to three years. This is not what most people think. In fact, that's what I love about demography. Most of the answers are things people don't think. Let me give you a quiz. What metro area of the top 100, biggest 100 metro areas, Denver, New York, St. Louis, Chicago, what metro area is the only metro area in the United States that did not experience an increase in the number of Hispanic children between 2000 and 2010? Los Angeles. Because it's a maturing population, it's an aging population, it's a more settled population, and that, you know, what people are worried about when they think about the browning of America is that somehow it'll become more than 100% Latino, right? <laughs> I mean, I'd love it, believe me, but there's a, there's a great cartoon by a cartoonist named Lalo, and it's supposed to be a picture of the future, 2500, and it sort of looks like the Jetsons, right? And there's flying saucers and houses in the air, and there's two guys in the, in the bottom, and... And one looks at the other and he says, geez, I wonder how everybody got along before everybody became Latino. Um, <laughs> which actually is meant to tease at this notion that demographic change will continue unabated, but it also is something about the way Latinos look, about, look at race that I want to try to lift up in just a second. So we are leveling off. Uh, California uh, has one of the most long-term immigrant populations. This is the share of immigrants who've been in the state for longer than 10 years, you can see there's only one state that has more settled immigrants than us. That's Vermont, is that right? And that's because you have two immigrants. Um, which this chart shows. Uh, so. You can see here, this is Vermont. It's got a very low share of immigrants. California, a very large share of immigrants, but the most settled, right? So this is a very different kind of population. Um, and in fact, it really belies, and this again is something important for the rest of the country, what most people think. Um, so this is the uh, percent of immigrants who've been in Los Angeles County uh, for longer than 30 years, so old time immigrants. What percent of immigrants who arrived in the last 10 years in Los Angeles County, recent immigrants, do you think are Mexican? Kind of set you up for a low answer, right? What do you think the public thinks? 90%, right? 150%, right? Super Mexicans arrive across the border. I count for 1.5. Um, in fact, it's just a third, just one third of recent immigrants into Los Angeles County, just kind of the traditional Mecca, are Mexican. In fact, a lot of other Latino populations, Filipino, Chinese, Guatemalan, a Salvadoran, a Korean, Armenian, Asian Indian, etc. We have a very diverse immigrant population, and this is the fortune of the rest of the country. There's a couple things, um, and Ted, will you let me know about time? Uh, okay, so cue me at 10 and cue me at 5 so I can make kind of a dramatic and emotional close with tears. Um, so, so one thing to note about the immigrant population is that it's increasingly, and this is true of many people of color as well, it's increasingly suburbanizing, right? People are directly going, they're not just hopscotching from the city into suburbs, they're going directly into suburbs, even as second generation uh, Latinos and Asian Pacifics are moving to the suburbs, and increasingly as African Americans are moving to the suburbs as well. What that means is that a lot of our civic infrastructure around the arts, 
uh, but also around social justice, has traditionally been set up in main cities and not in the suburbs where these new folks were arriving. And there's tremendous needs in these areas. You can see that in Los Angeles County. I'm going to jump over this. Well, um, yeah, I'm going to jump over this to talk a little bit about one important thing, and that has to do with the way in which Latinos identify about race. Now, how many, you must have filled out the census, right? So you know the census asks you whether you're Hispanic or non-Hispanic, and it also asks you your race. The census first started asking that question in 1980. And they used to ask people first what race you were, and then they asked you whether you're Hispanic or non-Hispanic. And what they found out in 1980 uh, was that about 40% of Latinos marked themselves as other. And the, the census said, man, God, these Latinos are confused. But it's just the first year, so we'll do it again, right? So in 1990, they asked the same questions. What race are you? White, African American, Asian, Native American, other. And more Latinos than ever marked themselves as other. And the census said, we have to investigate this. So they started looking at the individual answers in the census. And they found that a lot of the people who marked other then wrote things like, Chicano, right? <laughs> like with an exclamation point. Um, <laughs> and so the theory was, these Hispanics need to get it out of their system, right? So they reversed the questions. And in 2000, they asked you first whether you're Hispanic, non-Hispanic. Then they asked you your race. And in 2000, more people than ever marked other. <laughs> and so what that should tell us is that Latinos are thinking about race in a different way than the binary we've traditionally experienced in the United States. That's not the way the census interpreted. This year, in the census question, it says, damn it, you have to mark a race. <laughs> and still, 44% of Latinos marked other. <laughs> right? So. We have a new group coming up that also has a different conception about racial identification and sees ethnic identification as trumping uh, racial identification. Now, what does this mean looking forward? This is a series of maps that we've produced with uh, PolicyLink, which is based in Oakland. And this, tends, this looks at different counties in the United States. And it starts in 1980 with the percent people of color by county. And uh, the darker areas have a higher percent people of color. The areas that are not yellow, but in the middle in terms of shades, have 40 to 50 percent. It looks like demographically that's a tipping point. When a county is around 40 to 50 percent, it tends to sort of tip over in the direction of being majority minority. So this is what it looked like in 1980. This is what it looked like in 1990, in 2000, the last census. Here's what's predicted for 2020 for 2030 and for 2040. Pretty dramatic changes. And we can see those changes as well in California. This is also a map of the counties in California. And here, basically, the browner the county, the browner the county. <laughs> so <laughs> this is the year 2000, 2010. 2020, 2030, 2040, 2050. So if you're from one of those areas that was pretty light before and you don't have a good taqueria now, <laughs> don't worry, one's coming. Uh, so these are big dramatic changes as we move forward over time. Um, and there's two things about these changes I really want to highlight about the geography of these changes. Um, one is the point I made before about the suburbs and the increasing movement of African Americans, Latinos, and Asians into the suburbs. If you ask the question 30 years ago, how do the suburbs of America's large metro areas look like relative to the country, they would have been much wider than the country on average. Today's suburbs for the large metro areas exactly mirror the country's demographics. The big cities are still more people of color, but the suburbs in the large metro areas are basically the country's demographics. It's really the small metropolitan areas and the rural areas that are dominantly white. So suburbanization. The second thing that's important has to do with the increasing 
uh, proximity of the African American and Latino populations in our major urban areas. So one way to take a look at this is to look at South Los Angeles, uh, who are, you know, pretty close to where I work at USC. Uh, Englewood's the, <laughs> the wood, the wood, right? It's a good movie too, I'm sure you've seen it. Uh, so this is Percent Latino in South LA, and you can see that it was the kind of eastern part of South LA that had a high percent of Latino uh, in 1990, 2000, 2010. The reverse side of that, this is the percent non-Hispanic black in 1980, in 1990, in 2000, and in 2010. And while it's not shown, there are actually a lot of folks moving into Englewood, into Hawthorne, and into Lawndale, jumping over away from the city. Now, one of the easiest ways to understand this is not so much through these maps as through the demographics of the high schools. So these are the, if you know LA, the classic high schools of South LA, Crenshaw, Dorsey, Fremont, Jefferson, Jordan, Locke, Manual Arts, Washington Prep. Uh, these are the numbers from 1981, 1982. You can see, for example, that Locke was 98% African American. Jordan was about 90% African American. Manual Arts was about two thirds African American. Here's what it looks like for the last year for which we have data. I'll do that again because I like that sound. Um, <laughs> So you can see manual arts going from about two-thirds African, two-thirds Latino, uh, two-thirds African American, 30% Latino, to being 18% Latino, 80% uh, 80% Latino, 18% African American. A place like Locke, which was 98% African American, uh, becoming uh, two-thirds Latino. So a dramatic change, and it's one of the reasons why getting arts education in those schools is so critical, because it's a way for people to deal with those changes, for people to deal with the tensions, uh, for people to deal with the issues of self-expression, which are incredibly important in these moments of transition. Uh, one other thing you might want to know about this data, uh, in 1981, 1982, there were exactly 37 white students in these schools in South LA. In 2008, 2009, there were exactly 37 white students in these schools. We think they're the same students. <laughs> and we're launching a research project called No Child Left Behind, for which <laughs> for which we are seeking funding. So, uh, oh, wait a minute, no solicitation. Sorry, OK. Um, so I'm going to jump over the rest of these slides. Um, so when people see all this change, they tend to think it's something that's happening way off in the future. Uh, but in fact, it's something that's very much happening now uh, and has consequences now. Uh, this shows you for California, uh, the difference in the demography between those who are older than the age of 65 and those who are below the age of 18. Uh, for those who are above the age of 65, it's about 63% white. What's true about people above the age of 65? That's the answer most of my students give. They're going to die. <laughs> I don't like that answer <laughs> since I'm 55. Uh, uh, but they vote, right? They vote a lot, right? And in fact, they vote about the future of a population under the age of 18 that's 70% kids of color. And recently, we've been taking to calling that a generation gap, and it's a generation gap, as you'll see in a second, that actually does make a difference. Um, and you can see it in the census, uh, the median age by race and ethnicity, and the startling thing that came out from the census, most people focused on was that 43% growth rate that I was talking about. Here to me is the most startling fact. The median age for non-Hispanic whites, half older, half younger, is 41 years. The median age for Asian Pacific Islanders in the United States, 35. The median age for African Americans, 32. The median age for Latinos, 27. 41, 27. Basically, a generational divide, which tells you why there's also the numbers coming up, because that folks are in prime childbearing age. But that generational divide tends to have consequences in terms of investments. Let me just jump over these. 
Um, there has been a growing generation gap in the United States, and that gap, what we've done is we took a look at states that had much larger generation gaps. You understand that term, right? What state, by the way, do you think had the largest generation gap, the whitest old, the brownest young? Vermont. Everybody loves Vermont. <laughs> no, those two immigrant dudes are really old, man. So it's uh, Arizona. And is it any wonder, right? The conflicts that they're having around undocumented immigration, about taking ethnic studies out of the schools, et cetera. Well, it turns out that places where the demographic generation gap is larger, investment on state infrastructure is lower, and investment in schools is lower, right? That is the educated investment in students, uh, uh, per capita spending on students. And we are going to need, as a nation, to heal that generation gap in order to really deal with the future of the country. So I'm going to jump over these really intriguing slides. Um, so what are the implications for art? Now, you may ask what that is a picture of, right? That is my son, <laughs> who is a musician whose backup career is as an actor. <laughs> he has been way too influenced by you guys, <laughs> and he needs your help. Um, he is also as I mentioned, Teddy is a vegan, right, uh, who lives in Echo Park, right, and basically dresses in black hipster clothes. So it's really both wonderful and pathetic at the same time. <laughs> so what are the implications for arts? There's a report that just came out today, and I think Aaron Dorfman's talking about it today at four, uh, which is about arts, culture, and social change, remarking that only 10% of grant dollars have been made with a primary or secondary purpose of supporting the arts explicitly benefit underserved communities, including lower income populations, communities of color, and other disadvantaged groups, and less than 4% focus on advancing social justice goals, things that are so crucial to that new demography. And what the report, and I urge you to read it, and this is not because Aaron told me to, uh, but because it looks quite good, is that most arts philanthropy is not really engaged in these issues, and it calls for sustaining the canon, but making sure it gets to new communities. It calls for nurturing new forms of culture, it calls for arts education, as I did, and it calls for thinking about arts-based economic development as part of a package that can begin to heal some of the social issues and economic issues as well. But it's more than the kinds of policies that are being called for there. Art is, in fact, fundamentally about self-expression, about community building, and about democracy. I want to flip back to this lovely picture. Um, you know, my son, when he was heading off to college, we decided to uh, give him a treat and ourselves a treat, and the whole family went to Hawaii, to Maui. And on one of those, do you know how, like, you really can't talk to your kids about deep things? Um, but, uh, but sometimes you can, right, when it's just the right moment and everybody's relaxed and you're not, particularly if you're men, looking at each other. So I leaned back one day with my son. I said, you know, well, Joaquin, what is it that you, you know, you're going into theater school. What is it that you really want to do with your life? What's the driving purpose? And he just said, you know, I want to make things of beauty with my friends. Art is about making things of beauty with our friends. Art is about self-expression, community building, and it's a fundamentally democratic exercise of people getting their voice into the public arena. And we need to get past the stri strictly utilitarian notion of arts, either that it's really just good for educating kids or that it's going to generate economic development. Those arguments need to be there, but we need to hearken back to the fact that art, writing, music, is a way that we make sense of and experience the world. Now, what does that mean in terms of the work you need to do? Um, I think it means understanding that equity and inclusion is an important part of your work. I think it means understanding that you're going to have to put together some unexpected alliances to move your own agenda forward, particularly with these new and changing populations. And it's also going to mean that we need to rethink what we mean about collaboration 
and conflict. You know, people tend to uh, think when they hear collaboration of that uh, ride in Disneyland, it's a small world after all, <laughs> where all the children are singing. And uh, I mean, is collaboration like that for you? I describe collaboration as principled conflict, right? Because if you're collaborating with somebody and there's no conflict, they were already on your team, right? You're not really collaborating. You're collaborating when you find somebody you've got a conflict with, in which you have some principles about goals you agree on and principles about how you will conflict with one another to be able to move things forward. And that's going to require a very different kind of leadership, and here's where I will close. <clears throat> In thinking about the kind of leadership we need today in our society, in the world that you're in, of arts, in the world that I tend to be in of politics and demography, we need a new kind of leadership. And I used to, when I was at UC Santa Cruz, run something called the Summer Institute Change Across Borders, which brought together folks from Latin America with Latinos in the United States to talk about transnational organizing. We were doing this 10 years ago before transnationalism was hip. And at one of those get-togethers, a man named Victor Quintana, who was an organizer of campesinos, farm workers, peasants, from Sinaloa said, you know what? There's two kinds of leaders in this world. There are leaders who like the game of chess, and there are leaders who like the game of the jigsaw puzzle. And we looked at him just like you're looking at me. What the hell does that mean? And what Victor said was, you know, in chess, there's only two colors, right? Usually black or white. In the jigsaw puzzle, there are many different colors, and sometimes a single piece itself can be multi hued In chess, some pieces are far more powerful than others. You are always bummed out when you lose your queen. In the jigsaw puzzle, every piece is important. Every piece has a role. In chess, you get ahead by literally knocking someone off their territory, kind of gentrifying their neighborhood. <laughs> In the jigsaw puzzle, you get ahead by putting the pieces together so seamlessly that you do not know where one ends and another begins. In chess, the object is to win. In the jigsaw puzzle, the object is to complete the tapestry. We as a nation have been playing too much chess and not enough jigsaw puzzle. We have been... <laughs> allowing this demographic change to stir up anxiety, rather than asking ourselves about the bigger tapestry that is America. We've made a false division between high art and popular culture. We've made a false division between social justice and commitment to the arts and self-expression. We have been dividing ourselves city against suburb, community against community. And we will only greet that new American future if we finally find a way to weave ourselves back together into a common narrative of hope. Thank you.